where do you get your first hand, and what is the best cartridge and bullet for mixed bag big game hunting in the West? We hope to answer those questions and more on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. We've got some great questions from our listeners, and we're going to jump right into them after I point out something that they've been asking about. My holy little plaque behind me here, YouTube's welcome to the 100,000 subscriber market. They give you this cool little plaque. Uh, but when I got to 200,000, they didn't want to give me one. And 300,000, they didn't want to give me one. <laughs> and 400,000. So I made my own by shooting the target. We've got a 20 caliber hole in it for our 200,000 subscriber. We have a 30 caliber hole for our 300,000th subscriber. And we recently gave it a 40 caliber hole for our 400,000th subscriber. And we thank you all for making that possible. I'm not real sure what we'll do if we hit 500,000. <laughs> Sounds to me like a 50 BMG might just destroy that little plaque. But we'll see. Cross that bridge when we get to it. Thanks, everybody. Now to our questions one of which my wife is raising behind the camera. And my wife reminds me to say that that plaque is for Ron Spomer Outdoors, our main channel, not the podcast channel. But if you would like to get us and the podcast channel pushed up to 400,000, we'll be happy to shoot another 40 caliber hole in it. Thank you, guys. All right. Let's see what Max has to say here. Ron, I just watched your Predator cartridges video. You showed your fur collection. Where do you get your hides preserved? I love how yours looked. How can I get mine to look like yours? Well, I wrote right back to our patron, Max, and said, just go to Moyle Mink and Tannery in Hayburn, Idaho. That's M-O-Y-L-E, Mink and Tannery. They have a net address of M-O-Y-L-E dot net. Those guys really know how to do soft furs like this red fox and coyote back here. Very supple. I like it. All right. Let's see. Daryl. Daryl is asking about uh, copper bullets inaccuracy. Ron, on one of your recent videos or podcasts, you mentioned the known issue when switching between all copper bullets and gilded metal lead core bullets. Unfortunately, if I've ever heard about this issue and the proper way to transition a rifle from shooting one to the other, and I've forgotten it. Can you share with me here or on one of your Q&A videos what this issue is? Uh, never shoot copper before gilding metal or vice versa. And if someone does want to switch from one to the other, what cleaning is needed so you don't run into this inaccuracy issue? Great question, Daryl. The consensus seems to be that if you want to get supreme accuracy out of your all copper bullets, you shouldn't fire them through a barrel that has been fouled by standard bullets, gilding metal jacketed, cup and core bullets, all that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I think that it comes down to you lay down the fouling from the gilding metal, which is usually 80 to 90% copper and the rest of it is zinc. Um, that seems to affect the accuracy of all copper bullets. I don't know exactly why, but they all pretty much say this and several of the manufacturers actually put little warnings in their boxes saying for, for best accuracy, clean down to bare metal before starting to use these bullets. So that seems to be the answer. If you want to shoot and get great accuracy out of all of your copper bullets, your all copper bullets, clean your bore to get rid of the old fouling. And ideally you want to get rid of all the copper fouling or the gilding metal brass looking stuff that's inside not just the powder residue stuff um, and then shoot and foul with an all copper bullet and stick with it um, i did not heard that going the other way has this problem but you might want to do some experimenting of your own and if you're having issues with your accurate rifle suddenly shooting poorly when you switch ammunition you might just try this trick with all in any of them. Clean that barrel down to bare metal, then foul it with your new load, and then after two or three shots to get it nicely fouled with that one, then you should be able to get your best accuracy. That's the best I can tell you. I hope it works for you. Ah, uh, let's see. Jason. No, here's Roy. First of all, Roy says, Ron, where are your shooting glasses? 
exclamation point three times. That is a no-no. Well, Roy is right. I often forget to put on my shooting glasses. I have regular prescription eyeglasses that I get in polycarbonate for protection. Um, so I can use those. But yes, you should use eye protection. You never know when something untoward might happen with your shooting. If you want to protect your vision, wear your safety glasses. Great advice, Roy. Here is Jason. So the larger case diameter just before the start of the shoulder is what caused the action to be hard to close. Oh, this must be in reference to a video I did. Um, I was shooting a 308 test for a uh, magazine article I have to do shooting this 308 and one of the loads oh my goodness it was just really hard and i thought wait a minute everything's been sliding in nice and easily this is a factory load why is it seem to be oversized and not wanting to close smoothly before pulling the trigger i thought i'd better check this thing out opened it and what do you know the 308 cartridge was actually a 6.5 creedmoor somebody had put the creedmoor into the box of 308 winchester it was a new box of ammunition, and my conjecture is, in a store, someone's looking at an ammo, they go, I wonder what this bullet looks like, this cartridge looks like, and they take a round out of the box, and then maybe they also compare it to another one. So he's got a 308 Winchester, and he says, boy, this looks a lot like that 6.5 Creedmoor. He pulls that one out, and looks at the two of them, and puts them in the wrong boxes. But this ammunition was provided to me by the manufacturer, which just happened to be Hornady. Now, I don't want people to think that, oh, my gosh, Hornady is really sloppy in there. They're producing ammunition that has the wrong rounds in it and stuff. Who knows where that box had been? I'm guessing is what usually happens is that the manufacturer has someone doing PR work for writers doing research for magazine articles like I'm doing. And they send out sample ammunition to be tested for the article. Someone has a stock of that in the office, and when writers like me or the editors who assign this stuff say, hey, provide this writer with this ammunition for our test, they've got the ammo sitting on their desk, and they're doing the same thing. People stop in to visit them and say, hey, how you doing? What do you got there? Oh, it's the new load we got, and you start playing around with things, and you put them in the wrong box, and then that box gets sent out. But I have heard from a lot of folks on this one who have found the same thing in various kinds of ammunition. Winchester, Remington, and Nosler, not so much. One guy said Nosler is really consistent, and I found that to be true. But don't expect every manufacturer to be perfect. It's like everything else that I always talk about. None of us is perfect. So it pays to check all your ammunition. Open that new box and read the head stamps on them and make sure they say, they're matching up with what's on your rifle. I've seen guys shooting 300 Win Mag ammunition and 300 Weatherby <laughs> rifles. Um, crazy things like a guy named Ron Spomer one time shot a 7 millimeter 08 out of a 25 out 6. <laughs> Gotta pay attention, guys. <clears throat> Still have my fingers. And in that incident, when I was not firing the 6.5 Creedmoor in that 308 rifle, I didn't have my safety glasses on. Roy, you almost got me big time there, buddy. Wear those safety glasses because odd things like this can happen. All right. Now, let's see. Brian, good morning, Ron, from the great state of Michigan, the thumb state. My question is, what would be your pick of caliber and bullet weight to hunt Western animals? Elk, mule deer, and antelope. Thanks, Brian. Oh, Brian, that's a great question. And it gets asked a lot because... The dream of so many hunters from back east and the Midwest is to hunt the West, a glorious Rocky Mountain country. I mean, the lore about elk and moose and all the Western game just appeals. And eventually, we all want to get out there. I know I did when I was a kid, and I ended up moving out West to take advantage of it. So what cartridge is best? Gosh, you ask 12 people and you probably get 12 answers. But here are some really good dependable ones. Obviously, the old 30 out 6 fits all of this. So does the 270 Winchester, really. Um, a lot of people think it's too small, but everything's been taken with it. Use the right bullet, shoot precisely, and it's going to work just fine. Some people will step down into the 6.5s and take everything with it, and those seem to be working really well, too. But I think if you say, well, if we're going to be hunting elk and moose, yes, uh, 26 caliber might do it, but I think you're better off starting with that 270. 
I may be wrong on this one because I've taken big game with the 25s and the 26s as well. But it's a good, good average to start with that 270 Winchester. Um, similarly, 7 millimeter 08 or 308 Winchester, even though they're short cartridges, they've got enough to get the job done. They just don't have quite as much reach. But these days, that's not as essential as it used to be because we have laser range finders. So we know exactly where that animal is and we can compensate with dialing, holding high or whatever we need to do. Uh, so we've got the equipment to take advantage of that kind of thing. But if you like a flat shooting cartridge that also deflects minimally in the big winds we often get out here in the West, start with that 270 and a high BC bullet, go into the seven millimeters. Those are my favorites. I love the seven rem mag, 280 AI, but I'll do just fine with a 708 or 757 Mauser or any of the other sevens with the right sleek bullet. More velocity always helps, but it's not absolutely necessary. But the high BC bullets can really help in the wind. And the 7 millimeters get there much more quickly with a lighter bullet than do the 30s. Now the 30 calibers, of course, have long been representative of the ultimate all-arounder, which is why I mentioned the 30 out 6 right off the bat. But if you want a little flatter trajectory, a little more reach, 300 wind mag. 300 H&H, &H, 300 Weatherby, 300 PRC, any of the 30 Magnums will do the trick. You're just going to have more recoil. Got to be ready to handle that, which again, slip down into the sevens. And 175 grain to 180 grain bullet out of a seven rem mag or any of the faster sevens is going to actually put more energy on target, shoot flatter, deflect less in the wind than the 300 magnums shooting 180 grain bullets and even 200 grain bullets. You have to get up into the 210 grain bullets and heavier in the 300s to get the same ballistics coefficient you do in those 175, 180 grain, 7 millimeter bullets. And if it's all about energy on target, that's what you need to know. So um, I think you're going to do well there. I would say if you can handle the magnums, 7 rem mag it, It's just... It's been doing it for since 1962, and it still does it. Some of the newer ones give you a few slight advantages here and there. I don't think they're huge. I would definitely look at that new 7mm PRC. They sort of optimized everything in that one. And um, another good option is the 280 Ackley Improved. I really like that, and I have used it a lot. I've taken moose and elk and sheep and pronghorn and just about everything with that thing. So uh, that was a little less recoil. A little bit lighter rifle, perhaps. You can have some great luck with that. Those are what I suggest. All right, now this is uh, Grits. Now that'll re that reminds me of Grits Gresham, the old outdoor writer from the 50s and 60s. He was quite the entertainer. Grits Gresham, but this is probably not Grits because he passed several years ago. Grits says, regarding RSO video on the 360 Buckmaster versus the 3030, what is the point of a straight walled cartridge law? Sorry, straight-walled hunters. <laughs> well, grits, it's just one of those government regulations. Some states think that straight-walled cartridges are safer in the woods and the fields than bottleneck cartridges. I don't get it because it just really doesn't make sense. They think that the less reach, they always seem to want to go for maximum range as if everyone is out there tilting their barrels up into the sky at 35 degrees and launching a bullet for several miles that might land who knows where. Obviously, hunters know better than to shoot at a skyline. And once your bullet hits the ground or the trees or something, you're going to have maybe a ricochet. Um, but other than that, I don't see where there's an advantage in having a straight walled cartridge throwing a heavier bullet more slowly than a bottleneck cartridge throwing one more quickly. One could argue just the opposite effect. The faster bullet is probably going to disintegrate or stop sooner than the heavier bullet, which maintains its momentum and has a lot of ricochet and skip going on. But the theory is that a 4570 fairly slow would be safer to use in the woods than a 300 Weatherby Magnum. Something like that. At any rate, they pass laws saying you've got to use a straight-walled cartridge, and that's why they're out there. The 360 buck hammer, Remington looked at this law and said, you know, there are so many hunters who love the 30-30 lever-action rifles. You can't use it in a straight-walled state. Why don't we offer them the same rifle and put a bottle, get rid of the bottleneck, make it a straight wall? That would make the 30-30 into the 360 buck hammer, essentially. And they 
both perform about the same, but now you're legal. So that's why they have the darn things. All right, great question. Now let's see, I think we've got to go to all of these surprise questions they pull up for me. And this one comes out of Wisconsin. A lot of deer hunters in Wisconsin. And this one is called Cable. No, Caleb. Sorry about that. Caleb from Wisconsin. Hey, Ron, I love your YouTube channel. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I am getting a 460 Smith & Wesson Magnum revolver, and I'm undecided on a red dot or a scope. Hmm, any input? If I go with a red dot, what do you recommend that can handle the recoil? You know what? I am going to recommend against the red dot just because of the long reach potential of the 460 Smith & Wesson. This is, as much as I can remember from my research, the flattest shooting revolver cartridge out there. It's big, it's powerful, it's fast for a revolver cartridge, and you can really reach out there. Fairly flat trajectory with the Dern thing. I think you want to scope for that. Um, look into the handgun scopes. If you like the idea of a red dot, illuminated reticle scope will do it for you. And then you'll be able to dial your power up a little more and more clearly see your target. You just use a typical a red dot and you've got that red dot covering up your target too much beyond about 50 yards. Great for 50 yards and in, but man, once I start extending past that, I prefer a scope. So that's how I would look at it. Maybe your eyes are better than mine, but try a red dot on a target that's 100 to 150 yards away and see if it's not obscuring too much for you. I think you'll find more precision in the scope. All right, from Arizona is Christopher. Other than marketing, why is the 300 h and H dying? It seems like manufacturers killed a great cartridge. Powder-wise, isn't it more efficient than the 300 Win Mag? Is there anything within 300 yards that it can't kill as well as all the other 300 Magnums? It's also a little bit milder in recoil. Well, you're right, Christopher. It is, um, but it was pretty much given its death sentence by its improved cousin, the 300 Winchester Magnum. The 300 Weatherby Magnum started it. Um, you know, that was much superior to it way back in the 1940s, but it was only available in Reming or in Weatherby rifles, and they were pretty pricey, so the average hunter didn't get one. When Winchester came out in, I think it was 63, with the 300 Win Mag, which is a little bit less powerful than the 300 Weatherby Magnum, that one people gobbled up because you could get it in a Model 70, and pretty soon it was chambered in the Remington rifles and everything else. Short action, well... Standard length action, no longer than the 30 out six. That's what made it really handy. The 300 Weatherby Magnum is a full Magnum length action too. And that also sets popularity back a bit. But you are correct in that the 300 H&H can do it all. It's just probably 150 to 200 feet per second slower with the same bullets from the 300 Win Mag. So you know how we hunters are. It's like, well, if I can buy this one or this one, but this one <laughs> is 200 feet per second faster, then that's the one I want. But I last year shot the 300 H&H &H, or two years ago, quite a bit, especially in Africa. Used it a little bit here in the States. I loved it. I don't know exactly why. I mean, it's just another 30 caliber, um, a little bit faster than the 30 out six, a little bit slower than the 300 Win Mag, but certainly did the job. And with modern bullets like that Hammer Hunter I was shooting in it, oh, man, that thing was flat and fast, and I just loved it. And there's something about that sleek shape. Instead of We're so used to these 30, 35-degree, and even 40-degree shoulders on cartridges these days. The old 300 H&H &H has a long, sloped shoulder, but it, doesn't, it seems to, to cycle like butter. It's just very smooth and slick. I've never had the 300 Win Mags jam up on me or anything like that. Not even the WSM versions with the 35 degree shoulder. Really not a problem. But there's just something about that slick action of that long, sleek 300 H&H &H missile coming out of the magazine and into the chamber. That's just sweet. So, yeah, it's never going to be popular again. But, boy, if, you like, if you're a little bit nostalgic and you like tradition, give that 300 H&H &H a try. But that's why it's... It's going away. It's just been kind of stolen the thunder with the bigger 300 Magnums these days. All right, Joshua from Texas. What do you think of the 338 straight? 
I think I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen the 300, uh, 338 straight. Uh, is that the 338 Winchester Magnum blown out so that you don't have a shoulder on it anymore? I would have to assume that's what it is. So it would be a wildcat. And I can understand why someone might want one for a s jurisdiction in which it is required. But I don't know of any that would mm, require that or allow it because that's a pretty long cartridge. But mm, I don't know. It's obviously going to be a lot slower than a typical 338. Well, no, wait a minute. It can't be the 338 Win Mag straightened out. What am I thinking? That wouldn't be a 338 anymore unless they retain the name. But I, by the time you flare that thing out, you're up in the 40s for your caliber. So I just don't know what a 338 straight is. Sorry, guys. Somebody else help me here. What's a 338 straight? Maybe this guy's playing poker or something. <laughs> Ah, Christopher in Arizona. Christopher in Arizona, didn't I just hear from you? Oh, well, we'll hear from you again. Please compare the differences between the 243 Winchester, 6mm Remington, 6mm Creedmoor. Is there enough difference to justify buying anything besides the 243 Winchester? I just bought a new 243 Winchester. <laughs> Looks like Christopher's looking for affirmation here. <laughs> I, by nature, rarely take a shot over 200 yards under perfect conditions, maybe 300 yards. Beyond that, I don't consider it hunting. It's just assassination. Ooh, that's strong. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended you. <laughs> oh, thank you. You interpreted it properly. The closer I get, the better I feel. Well, more power to you, Chris. I never argue against somebody who wants to get closer. It's always the safest move. You know, it's just a lot harder to screw up a shot when you're closer unless the proximity to the animal gets your buck fever going too much. <laughs> Some people like a little more distance. They can get away with a little more movement. They can wait for their heart to quit pounding so hard and take a steadier shot at 300 yards than they might at 30. <laughs> but if you can do it, more power to you. I like getting close myself. But um, as far as comparing these, okay, the 243 Winchester, all, all of these, of course, shoot the same bullets, unless your twist rate is kind of slow. And that's kind of the issue between the 243 Winchester and the former 244 Remington, which is now the 6 millimeter Remington. The original 244, what they called it, came out with a barrel twist rate that was a little too slow to stabilize 100 grain bullets. So it lost in popularity. Hunters back in those days seemed to think you could not kill a deer with a 90 grain bullet which this, the 244 was offered in, you had to have 100. So they went with the 243 Winchester, even though it was 100 feet per second slower than the 244 or the now 6 millimeter Remington. So there's the difference between those two. Now, the 6 millimeter Remington has a 1 in 10 inch twist barrel. Some of them are even 1 in 9, I think. Yeah, they're 1 in 9. That's what they are. So they're going to stabilize not just a 100 grain bullet, but probably the 103 grain bullets, maybe the 105s. The, similar with the 6 millimeter Creedmoor. They took the 6.5 Creedmoor and necked it down to 6. That's getting to be real popular, a little faster than the 243 as well. So all of them are within about 100 to 150 feet per second of one another. They all throw the same bullets, get the faster twist rates, and you're going to have real similar performance. So I think you're spot on with this 300 yard maximum. They can certainly reach 400 yards, but they're starting to run out of steam out there. Not that steam is everything. The right bullet in the right place is still is more important than how much energy it's carrying when they get there. You only need enough energy to penetrate to the vitals, ideally through the vitals and out the backside to leave another hole for more, um, more of a chance of good blood trailing. Uh, but it's not the energy that's going to knock this animal down until you get, yeah, you've got to get up to a size that's probably more powerful than the average human could stand to shoot. Um, it's not energy that kills, it's destruction of the vital tissues through tearing and or cutting. That's why bow hunters are so successful. There's no energy involved in it other than getting the arrow into the vitals where they cause hemorrhaging. Bullets do roughly the same thing. It's just a little more ragged. <clears throat> so um, I think you're going to do fine with that 243 Winchester. This is uh, from Pretoria, South Africa. Ruan, R-U-A-N, Ron, Ruan, not sure how they pronounce that. Good day, Ron. I'm a new hunter looking to buy a one-do-it-all rifle. I would like to hear your advice on choosing between the 300 WSM and the 30 6 Springfield. Hope to hear from you soon. Well, I hope this is soon enough for you. Um, boy, you know, that's kind of a tough call. 
I like them both. The 30 out 6 you're probably going to find more ammunition in more places in more varieties than you ever will for the 300 WSM. The 300 WSM, of course, will allow you to get a slightly shorter rifle since it's in a short action, whereas the 30 out 6 is your standard length action. If that makes a difference to you, consider that. Um, you're probably going to get one more round down in your magazine with the 30 out 6 because it's a narrower cartridge. The fatter 300 WSM, you usually shorted by one round. So you might only get three in versus four or four versus five, something like that. Now, the 300 WSM is giving you almost identical ballistic performance to the 300 Win Mag, which is the longer one like the 30 out 6. So you do have that advantage in the velocity, probably two to 300 feet per second faster than the 30 out 6. So you'll be able to shoot a little bit flatter with that, reach a little bit farther. Um, and if you use the uh, heavier high BC bullets, you'll get a little less wind deflection and that sort of thing. But gosh, the 30 out 6 in Africa, I mean, that is a classic. Um, Hemingway used it. He took, gosh, he took Sable with it. He took a, a running rhino. Pretty sure it was a black rhino one. It was way out there. If I remember right, 300 yards and running. They did a lot of that crazy stuff back in those days. But he rolled it with a 30 out 6. And plenty of people have taken elephant with a 30 out 6. So the 30 out 6 can do the job. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You're just going to have to make up your mind on this one. I could roll with either one of those. Give me either one of them and send me to Africa. I'll be happy to use them. <laughs> All right, uh, Devin from Ohio. Hi, Ron. I'm looking at going on my first hunting trip to South Africa. He's going to go over and visit Ruan. Uh, there are many different safaris and packages offered, and I don't know what to look for in choosing a safari. Any advice or recommendations on what to look for in a safari, or even if it's a good idea to select a package hunt for the first time trip? Ah, oh, yeah, those are great questions, Devin. Package hunts can be really affordable and pretty pretty good. It comes down to the outfitter or the PH or the rancher who's offering this and the kind of setup that they have. And these vary widely from a relatively small ranch fenced in to vastly huge ranches fenced in to vast unfenced areas involving several different ranchers, consortiums sort of. And there's not much for really big, wide open public lands that I know of in South Africa. So don't imagine the, the classic African hunt in which you're out in the wilderness. Those are few and far between these days that the human population in Africa is just going through the roof and there are not a lot of wilderness areas left. But there are some that are managed as hunting blocks in which development is not allowed. And that, of course, really helps wildlife. So many people think that hunters are killing off wildlife. That's not it. That's all managed for sustainable use. It's the changing of the habitat into farms and mines and all the rest of the stuff we know so well. That's what hurts the wildlife populations. But on the ranches in South Africa, they have realized that they can make as much money, produce as much protein with native game than they could with sheep and cattle and other domestic livestock. So... That's why the smaller farms are full of wildlife and they offer these package hunts. But you might not enjoy it because it's in a small area. You don't see a lot of country and you know in your head these animals are not able to get out of the fence and migrate and whatever they used to do. So it just makes it a little bit too easy perhaps. The bigger ones where you've got miles and miles and miles between the fences I think are pretty fair representations of wild hunting because they can get away from you quite easily. Oftentimes, well, heck, I've hunted on some of them that reportedly had 60 inch kudu and in seven, eight days of hard hunting, we never saw the 60 inch kudu. <laughs> so that's something you wanna consider. Now the consortium ones where you have five, 10 different ranchers are kind of nice in that there are no high fences, but they all share in the bounty. So all the ranchers allow the wildlife on their property and they, the pH pays them equally. If he shoots a kudu, whether it's on this guy's actual land or this guy's or that guy's, they can go wherever they want. They shoot it and they divvy it up amongst everybody. So that's a nice option. Ask about those things when you're looking into these hunts. How big is the place? Is it high fenced or not? And all the rest. And then on your package deal, yeah, they're going to offer you some real common animals on there. But when you look at the price per, 
comes out as a pretty good deal. So if you're happy with a, a little diker and a Steenbuck as two of your five, and then there's maybe your big one is an Oryx or maybe a Kudu or maybe both, or a Heart of Beast or something kind of in the middle, you just have to judge whether those are the species you want to hunt. Uh, or if you could trade them for something else, most of them will allow add-ons. So you get your little package hunt, you shoot the common stuff, and then you can say, I would like to give you a little more money and hunt something else. They'll give you the price and you might be off hunting Neyland. So ask all of those things. There are many, many great outfitters over there that do it this way on the private ranches. And I have had some absolutely wonderful hunts. Couple of times it was iffy and it was not all that much fun and pleasant. And I pulled out early. So you do want to do your research. And while you are visiting with um, PHs and outfitters in that particular country, you might drop the name when you're visiting with other ones who may know them to get a little uh, little dirt on the competition perhaps and judge that with a grain of salt because it might be that two guys don't like each other and they're going to spread some gossip and or lies about one another but you can get kind of a feel for what's a straight answer if you get say three or four different outfitters all saying that outfitter x is probably not your best bet you might want to pay attention but one or two offhand could just be sour grapes now, another real fun option is to go to some of the shows here in the States, and they can vary from a very uh, inexpensive local show, uh, a hunting and fishing weekend show somewhere where outfitters will have a booth and you can talk to them in person. Or you can go to the big shows like the Dallas Safari Club, Houston Safari Club, Safari Club International, Western um, Hunting and Shooting Expo in Salt Lake City, where you get outfitters from many countries in Africa, and you can speak to them directly and compare and shop, go from one booth to the other and get a good feel for personalities. A lot of it comes down to personality. You just seem to get along with and or like this guy, or you think he's an arrogant so-and-so. You don't want to spend a week hunting with him. All right, here is from, wow, Utar. Where is Utar? And in the Southeast? Utar. No, that's somewhere in Asia. I just can't remember where Utar is. I'm thinking Mongolia country somewhere. At any rate, this is branded from Utar or Utar, U-T-A-R. Three questions, Ron. Smith & Wesson makes 460, 500, and 350 Legend revolvers. I did not know they made the 350 Legend in a revolver. Can we get a, comp I don't see how they could do that. The 350 Legend is not a rimmed cartridge. You might want to triple check that one. Um, can we get a comparison of those hunting in bear country? Okay. Second question, how does 350 Legend stack up against 10 millimeter 454 Casual and 44 Mag for bear defense? Can I come up and hunt with you? <laughs> I drive by your property all the time on my way up uh, to hunt with uh, friends for upland birds. It'd be an honor to stop in once and shake your hand. Now, you might even come with us. My friend, uh, oh, okay, from Sage Spring Kennels, they've got... If I remember, no, that's Rocky. I'm not sure what Sage Spring Kennels has for dogs. At any rate, this sounds like Brandon is pretty close to me here. And I'm going to answer his question now. On the, the Smith & Wesson 460 500, the 500 is more powerful. The 460 has more range and reach. Obviously, you're looking at two different bullet diameters on this one. So the big 500 is the 50. I'm pretty sure the 460 is a 458 uh, diameter bullet. but I might be wrong on that one. It might actually be an oddball, but I don't think there are any 46s. At any rate, it throws a bullet a lot faster than the 500 does. So it's got a lot um, more reach. That's the one I would choose for more downrange. For right in your face bear protection, I'd probably go with the 500. The 350 Legend, I just don't see where it's going to fit into revolver. And it's much punier than the 500 or the 460. It's more like a 3030 in its performance. Um... So how does it stack up against the 10 millimeter, 454 and 44? Again, you're not going to get it in a handgun. I, and unless I'm completely wrong here, folks, I just never heard of a 350 legend in a revolver. Revolvers always have rimmed cartridges and the 350 legend isn't rimmed. But the 10 millimeter, consider that the same as the 357 Magnum. Real similar ballistics on those. The 10 millimeter is a 40 caliber, so you got a little bit bigger diameter hole with it, but the energies and such are the same or awfully close. 454 Casul is like the 44 Magnum on steroids, so that's your biggest one. You probably would like that for your bear defense as far as the bullet's energy on the bear 
in its diameter, but the 44 mag might be a little easier for you to handle, uh, a little less recoil. So that's kind of the determining factor on those. I like the 10 millimeter myself. Uh, I think you can get it in a little bit lighter weight handgun that you're going to want to carry. Too many times guys will get a big revolver that weighs so much and they think, man, I'm really great for bear, but I don't think I need to haul that big heavy thing around today. I'm not likely to see a bear. And then they see the bear and the bear comes up close to visit with them and they don't have their handgun. Whereas a lighter weight 10 millimeter, you're probably always going to wear that because it's just more comfortable. All right. Now, can you come up and hunt with me? I don't know if you do take me to visit with your friends up north <laughs> and go bird hunting. We might just arrange that. Now, if you want more information on bear defense handguns, Joseph Von Benedict and I did one together here. So uh, I think it's titled something like the best pistols or best revolvers for bear defense. We covered both the autoloaders and the revolvers and the 10 millimeter as well as these big guys. Got some really good advice on that show about carrying and not wanting to carry and how to carry and which bullets to use. That's a big part of the equation. So you might want to check that out. Just look for the Bear Defense Handguns on Ron Spomer Outdoors regular channel on YouTube. All right. Now, that's about it. Time for our tip of the week. And the tip of the week is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that refers to your rifle's bore. Many people write in and say, Ron, I've seen your video where you say you don't have to clean your rifle. Oh, you do you have to clean it after every range session and you have to clean it after every sprinkle of rain and blah, blah, blah. I want to set this straight. Don't clean your bore unless it's no longer accurate or you need to protect it from the elements. But if it's dry and it's shooting precisely, leave it alone. Clean the rest of your rifle to keep the rust off of it and for function. But don't mess with the bore. That's working well for you. When it goes south, then you can clean it. That's my tip of the week. Hey, see you next time. In the meantime, hunt honest and shoot straight.